For most households around the world, the current conditions are not better than four or five years ago. In fact, they are worse uh, in terms of standard of living because ordinary people don't have a lot of assets. And so when asset prices go up, they don't participate to the same extent as Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk. Welcome to Thoughtful Money. I'm its founder and your host, Adam Taggart. There's a lot of uncertainty in the world right now, geopolitical, economic, social, and environmental. At times like this, when the path forward is unclear and the stakes are high, it's wise to tap the counsel of those with a strong command of the lessons of history and the practical experience of a lifetime in the market trenches. There are few who fit that description better than Dr. Mark Faber, editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report. Colorful, brash, and brilliant, Mark understands the global economy through a historical lens practically unmatched in the industry. And he's a declarative straight shooter who doesn't mince words. Mark, thanks so much for joining us today, all the way from Thailand. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and good day to all your viewers and listeners. Thank you, Mark. And uh, I just want to note you were one of the very first interviews on this new <laughs> Thoughtful Money channel. So great to have you back on. Um, happy to say the channel's done great. You look like you've done great in the interim. So uh, <laughs> thank you. And I'm excited to dive in here because, as I said in the intro, it's a, you know, it's a, there's a lot of uncertainty swirling out there in the air. And, and to be able to kind of tap the collective wisdom of folks like you who have been through a, a number of different cycles. You've seen a lot of what's what's out there, but you also have studied history, not just recent history, but from the recent to, <laughs> to all the way to ancient times. Um, and so, you know, to be able to kind of look through your lens and get your perspective on, on you know, what does today look like? How does it rhyme with previous moments we've seen in history? What's more likely to happen next? Can't wait to dig into all this with you. Uh, but to kick it all off, let me start with the general question I like to ask you at the beginning of these discussions. What's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? Well, as you know, the economy post-2009 uh, great financial crisis recovered, but it was a recovery that was financed largely by credit expansion and money printing <clears throat> and artificially low interest rates. Uh, both in the US and in Europe, and especially, of course, in Japan. And then we came up to 2018, 2019, and the economy, uh, the global economy at that time was already weakening, and then COVID happened, and then there was a big crash in the economy and in uh, financial markets, and then there was another recovery and new highs in financial markets. But again, there was a lot of money printing and especially uh, huge fiscal deficits that then led to relatively high inflation rates and eventually also to rising interest rates. But in most economies around the world, the economies have not recovered uh, to the pre-COVID times, to 2018-2019. Now, I'm saying this well understanding that GDP, what people look at in general, and they say the economy expanded, GDP was up and so forth, does not capture the reality of all people and certainly not the reality that the median household, the typical household in the world is facing, which is much higher costs of living and uh, somewhat higher wages, but wages that have not uh, gone up to the same extent as uh, the cost of living. In other words, for most households around the world, the current conditions are not better than four or five years ago. In fact, they are worse uh, in terms of standard of living because 
ordinary people don't have a lot of assets. And so when asset prices go up, they don't participate to the same extent as Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk and people like myself participate that essentially have assets that then tend to appreciate. So that is the view of the economy. And I think uh, the economies, they need to go into rehab, rehabilitation. But uh, the governments don't want that. So they keep on printing money and providing liquidity into the system. And it helps some people. The wealthy people have uh, advanced, have become even wealthier. But the uh, middle class and the lower middle class and the poor worldwide are less well off than they were five years ago. This is my view. Now, some economists will, of course, come and say, no, that's not true. The cost of living haven't gone up much and so forth. But... Uh, the evidence is very strongly supporting my view. So, Mark, I can tell you, living here in one of the wealthiest countries of the world, uh, America, um, also talking to a lot of Canadians, um, your words ring really true. You know, even, even in, again, some of the most wealthy countries on a you know wealth per capita basis, uh, I think the vast majority of, of the populace would completely agree with you say, hey, we, we, we are worse off than we are in 2018. So I've been talking about this a lot. I love that you started here. So maybe we'll just roll up our sleeves and get to the punchline really early. Um, so there's sort of two big trends going on. I, I think I hear you talk about. Um, one is that uh, our, our economic authorities, our economic and political authorities have decided to respond to the great financial crisis, the COVID crisis, with policies that have um, largely rewarded the already rich, right? Whether you can say it was intentional or not, those who own assets, as you said, are doing just great. Everybody else is worse off. So you have that happening in the in, in the immediate term, but they're all but also the policies that they've chosen to respond with are policies that have that are pulling tomorrow's prosperity into today. Right, we're we're doing this all through credit expansion and um, uh, you know uh, money printing, um, and so we're diminishing everybody's future prospects by doing that. But we're just taking that that money from the future, pulling it in and giving it to a a already well off group of people. What does history tell us when when that happens? Well, uh, I mean, there are many examples. Uh, every government that was running out of money has uh, essentially diminished the purchasing power of their currencies, of their, or of their money. In other words, they all created inflationary policies. They spent more then came into the treasury and this was financed by issuing lower and lower quality uh, coins say at the beginning of the roman empire a gold and silver coin had a very high gold and silver content say 99 or 98 percent at the end of the empire uh, it had practically no silver and gold content. You understand? Mm -hmm. uh, and we have to understand a deficit as we have today in the US uh, will lead, as you suggested, to some hardship in future. Now, the question is this future uh, it could be far away, it could be five, ten years away, and it could be relatively soon, because now, as you know, the rate of inflation has increased. And uh, depending on the household and depending on the con uh, your conditions in life, do you own a house already? Is it fully paid? Or do you have a lot of debts on your house? Do you have three children to look after and so forth? 
how many subsidies do you get? Each household has a different rate of cost of living increases. But say, for most people, it's been 5 and 10%. I've seen statistics that are relatively right, reliable that would argue that the cost of living is going up by even more than 10% per annum at the present mm. time. But I take now, say, a, a more modest figure of, say, 5 to 10%. At this rate, it would be a mistake to cut the Fed fund rate. Because if, say, inflation is at 6%, and the Fed fund rate is currently at five and a quarter percent approximately. Uh, the short term rates are still negative, and the 10 years treasury is at, say, 4.3 percent, also have a negative yield, inflation adjusted. Mm -hmm. So the Fed may choose to lower interest rates this year. Because one of the features of monetary inflation is that the economy basically goes in real terms into recession, but in nominal terms, it still expands. So a lot of people don't uh, notice that the economy is already in recession. And if the Fed would cut rates here, I think it would be highly inflationary. And I look at markets and I always think markets are some sort of a discounting mechanism. Now, usually when a country prints money, the currency goes down. And so people look at the dollar and they compare it to the yen and they compare it to the euro. And so far, the dollar has been holding up well. But more recently, as you know, Bitcoins have gone ballistic. Mm -hmm. They may be short term overbought. But more recently, in uh, since the beginning of March, gold and silver have gone up strongly. Now you have to ask yourself, why is gold and silver going up strongly right now? The gold and silver market may be smelling that in future there will be again money printing or more inflation, and that's why they're adjusting on the upside. And people normally don't look at gold and silver as a currency, but actually it is 99% uh, uh, clean currency. It is a true currency that throughout the ages have reflected fairly well the purchasing power of paper money. So let's say I take gold at $35 in the 1930s and it was fixed at $35 an ounce until 1971. So by 71, the gold should have been higher, but it was kept artificially low. But then they adjusted it on the upside and immediately gold shot up to $850 in January uh, 1980. Now, if we take as a starting point to be fairly adjusting for the purchasing power, we should take maybe 1970, 71 at about $100 an ounce. And now gold is at about $2,000 an ounce. So if I compare the cost of buying a house in 1970 and today, and if I compare the price of a Campbell soup in 1970 and today, gold has maintained its purchasing power. It has been a great store of value. I do not deny that certain other assets like stocks with continuous dividend reinvestments have outperformed gold since then. That I do not deny. But uh, in general, investors are jittery. So they buy at the wrong time and uh, sell at the wrong time. So they underperform the indices. So as an insurance and as a store of value, I still regard gold and silver as out 
as outstanding uh, assets. Now, more recently, when the gold and silver breakout took place, for the first time in a very long time, individual investors were selling. They were selling gold and silver and not buying additional, which tells me that this breakout on the upside is a very genuine breakout uh, and that prices will likely move higher. Of course, there will be corrections. But in general, the uptrend in gold and silver have been confirmed. And so I want to reiterate what I said for the last 40 years. Of course, nobody ever listens. I have always maintained that you need to hold some physical gold in your house or in your safe deposit box or wherever because you cannot trust any governments and you should never, ever trust a central banker. <laughs> okay. And I can, uh, I think I've been interviewing you for about 10 of those past 40 years and can, can reiterate that you've been delivering that message. Um, and it seems to be getting proved out here with this, this uh, breakout in gold and silver, as you talked about. Um, and you know what, Mark, it's funny you make that comment because um, I just yesterday uh, recorded an interview with uh, Thomas Honey, who was uh, CEO of the Kansas City Fed. He actually sat on the um, Federal Open Markets Committee in 2010. He was the lone dissenter. He actually had a, a record string of dissenting votes during Bernanke's Federal Reserve. Um, Sorry, what was, was his name? Thomas Honig, yes, H O E N I G. Yes. Yeah, yes, um, Honig. Yes, Honig, yeah, and and he was he, he was against QE, the lone voice against QE. Anyways, your point of not trusting a central banker, I think after having talked to to Dr. Honig, um, I think he would agree with you. <laughs> having having spent time in that lion's den, I think he would agree with you. Um, all right, well, look, um, I want to talk more about um, precious metals and you know any other assets you think are good for the future. Let me get back to one thing you said, though, because I also just recorded an interview with Jesse Felder, who made a similar point, which is um, we may we may be entering a period of you said inflation, Jesse says stagflation, um, but where on a nominal basis we might have positive GDP growth. Um, you know, we, the, the nominal indicators might might look okay, and we may be being told by the headlines, kind of like people feel like right, right now, they're being told it's a great economy, it's a great job market, but a lot of people are saying, that's not really matching my personal experience out here. What, what, what I think I hear you saying is, is we may need to prepare for a future where, yeah, maybe the, the, the nominal numbers don't look bad, but the real numbers are bad that we're on a real basis, we are in recession, we are in a, you know, a lot more um, stress than the, the headline numbers might suggest. Correct. I mean, there are statistics that don't lie, like container traffic or the CAS freight index. They're all flatlined for the last few years and the markets go ballistic. You know, the, I, I and then, as I said, it depends who you are. I give you an example, and I don't say this because I want to brag, but the reality is this. I run a business. Uh, I manage money, and I publish my newsletter, and I'm in the financial sector, okay? So I always have a large cash reserves because of the nature of my business, and because of my cautiousness. Now, in the last few years, on, say, a deposit of $10 million, maybe I got less than half a percent interest. Right. So, say, $50,000. Now, on a deposit of $10 million, I get 5% or more. So, it's 500000 I have no debts. I never had any debts in my life. I never bought anything on credit. I bought things when I had enough money. 
to buy them and nothing else. So for me, the situation of higher interest rates is moderately favorable. Of course, I'm aware that prices also go up more than before. So let's say an airline ticket and so forth and so on, and uh, to go out eating, the price has gone, say, over the last four years, for sure, the price of a restaurant is up something like 20 to 30%, depending where you are. But I don't spend uh, the money I earn all on food and energy and uh, insurance premiums and uh, maintenance of the house and so forth. But a poor household, they spend maybe if they have two children, they spend on the rent something like 40% of their income and on food maybe 20, 30%. At the end of the month, most people have not a penny to save. Most people. And we have statistics of the number of people who live paycheck to paycheck. The latest statistics show are approximately 66%. Yep. Now the number may be 50% or the number may be 70%, but it's at the highest level ever. And that's why I'm telling you, with statistics, you can show anything, anything you wish depending where you start your statistics from and how you compile your statistics. I mean, recently, this is most unusual. You spoke about Hernig before at the Fed. Well, Larry Summers is so, he's a well-known economist. He was, I think, Secretary of the Treasury under, under Obama or Clinton or whatever. whatever. Anyway... He recently published an article, and this is very unusual, that the former Treasury official would criticize the way the government compiles the rate of inflation at the present time. Mm -hmm. His rate of inflation peaked out at 18% last year. John Williams, who is a very, I mean, he's not Democrat or Republican or anything. He's a statistician who analyzes the figures very thoroughly of the CPI, how it's compiled, because you can overweight food or you can underweight food and you can overweight housing and you can underweight housing. You get totally different figures. He uses the methodology before the 1980s. His inflation figures is much, much higher than what the government is publishing. And Larry Summers, in this recent article now, which appeared in March 2024, uh, no, sorry, uh, that was Henry Kaufman two years ago. He already said that the rate of interest is relatively low compared to the rate of inflation. Whereas in the 70s, the interest was actually higher relative to inflation than it is now. Right. Well, so it, it, had, it view, had to get there to, to tame it, right? That's what Volcker had to do, right? He had to just go over. At the end, he pushed it up like uh, a madman. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's as Kaufman said, you want to fight inflation. You have to smash a fist in the face of investors and of the public. So they realize the central bank is serious about it. But we have statistics that show that recently inflation price increases have continued and are not going much lower. And yet the Fed tells the public we're going to cut rates three times this year, as if they knew that inflation would come off more. Well, there's one way inflation could come off more is if the supplies of goods increases much. But the service cost inflation, that will stay relatively high. Mm -hmm. We have goods deflation in some sectors because China is producing now goods very efficiently again. <laughs> but as you know, 
Miss Yellen is now in China. Why is she in China? She will never tell us. What the media is publishing in the U.S. is a scam, is misleading the public from A to Z about everything. Everything is a lie. I'm not saying all the journalists are dishonest, but the people that run the papers, the editors, are all on a payroll of someone and defend uh, the interest of some people, and they exclude uh, the truth from being published. So Mark, let me ask you this on that then. So like you say, you can kind of make any story you want with statistics, right? Which is why we have to look at these indicators that can't be fudged. Um, no matter what the headlines tell people, um, the one thing that people know for sure is how they feel and, and what their life, you know, their current life feels like to them. And, you know, we're seeing increasing skepticism. We're seeing increasing anger and resentment. Um, we're certainly seeing worldwide the rise of, you know, of, of um, populist candidates and nationalist candidates. And hey, let's forget about globalization. Let's take care of our problems first. We're seeing, you know, farmer protests across, uh, you know, Europe. Um, I mean, so people are beginning to say, look, I don't care what you're telling me anymore. Because I got a real problem and I, you know, and, and, and they're, they're getting their backs against the wall to the point where they feel like they have to get out there and grab the pitchforks. So, like, what, what do you expect from here? Um, it sounds like you're not too optimistic that that we're going to start making a lot of good policy decisions that are going to help the general person. It sounds like maybe you think things are going to continue to evolve from here. And I do want to get to the, the, the question of. Why do you advise people actually hold gold physically in their hands? Because while I agree with you, um, presum pre presumptuously, you're, you're recommending they do that for some maybe low probability, but but high emergency outcome. <laughs> well, uh, I need to address one question that you uh, brought up, which is, you know, people getting unhappy. Yes. But the people who are unhappy, they always say, oh, I'm a victim of this and that, and uh, the government should intervene. No, this is the problem. The voters voted for the most horrible leaders you can imagine. Most of them have no clue about the decisions they take. Completely clueless. And the Fed officials, everything that has happened recently was discussed and written about extensively by Milton Friedman in the 60s. But these people in central banks, they don't know how to read. They only read what they want to read, economic models. And uh, they want to go and give speeches so they get some money. They want to go advise people like Goldman Sachs so they get some more money and so forth and so on. And the financial sector, that I have also to say, the financial sector, each time the Fed prints money, they applaud. Why? Because the asset values of their portfolios that they manage go up right. and they get the performance fee and the management fee that's going up. And the people, the, the voters, if someone goes to the voters, look, and tells them the government debt is now $34 trillion in the U.S. This is the state, the federal state. And it's going up by a trillion dollars every hundred days. The interest is now over a trillion dollars a year. Mm -hmm. If interest rates stay here or go higher, uh, no, they just need to stay here. By year end, the interest payments on the debt will be $1.6 trillion, okay? And that will become a problem over time. So there are three solutions to this problem. Either we stop the increase in government spending entirely, it will reduce the rate of inflation, but not by much. 
What we need to do is to reduce government spending. We have to fire 20% of all government employees. You have a revolution in America. <laughs> yeah, then another solution is you go to the people and say, oh, we have to increase taxation by 20%. So the wealthy people will applaud that because the wealthy people have lawyers and accountants and all kinds of gimmicks and they can avoid paying taxes. But ordinary salary recipients, they pay the tax and they are the sufferers from these tax increases. So again, nobody will vote for someone who proposes that. The third solution which the public accepts you distribute money, you subsidize useless industries mm -hmm. like EV cars, EVs. It's a, economically, it doesn't make any sense to subsidize this industry. You subsidize windmills. Windmills are very unreliable for energy production and they're unproductive. And you do all kinds of gimmicks that the public likes. And they vote for the wrong people. So, uh, so human... we have to blame ourselves. I mean, I've been fighting against central bank policies for years. But each time I say something against central banks, my fund management friends, they come to me and say, oh, yeah, you're, you're right in principle. But look, it's better that our uh, portfolios go up in value yeah. than the otherwise. <laughs> So, so yeah, so um, human nature being what it is, uh, options one and two uh, require some degree of pain up front for the potential hope of a better future at some point in time, whereas option number three gives me something that feels good today, right? So human nature being what it is, probably highly likely we're going to go down the, that third path there, right, of, of gimmicks and subsidizing and all that stuff. Now, obviously, that doesn't work in the long run. So again, what does history tell us once that runs its course? Yes, this is a very good question. Uh, because in history, every country sooner or later resorted to money printing. And uh, you then create so an artificial boom. And uh, the artificial boom depends on the on the continuation of fiscal deficits and money printing and you get more and more inflation and uh, you can go for a long time like we've seen in Turkey and in Argentina but uh, the problem is that the standards of living of poor people keeps on going down you understand it, it creates then in a society, a lot of tensions and eventually and that's why historians like Will uh, Durand they pointed out that uh, empires don't collapse from the outside they collapse from the inside you know that there is a uh, tensions within the citizens the poor people they keep they have to be kept uh, subsidized. The Romans did it by giving out free wheat yeah, and right, food circuses, to the poor literally. people. And they gave them games, you know, the, in the Colosseum, uh, like uh, all these uh, combatants against animals and burning of people and so forth. There were not so many burnings as Hollywood produces, but there were maybe some, but there were spectacles. Nowadays, we have baseball, basketball, and football in America. And we have, thanks God, we have Taylor Swift. So we give the <laughs> public the Taylor Swift. And they forget about the dismal economic conditions they live in. Right. Well, we also have social media, which is sort of like a never-ending circus of distraction. Yes, to some extent, but, uh, you know, the social media <clears throat> uh, has also produced some 
sources of information that are incredibly useful because the mainstream media keeps on dishing out lies. But it's not better anywhere else. My gardener and helper, he's been with me for 20 years. He's a nice guy. He's a reliable person. He's not intellectually very high because he's an analphabet. He's, he can't read and write. Okay. He never went to school. But he has other skill, skill sets that I also have to remind myself. In life, not everyone studied economics. Other people, they know how to fix things. He's good at fixing things. Repairing less, but fixing. So he looks after my motorcycles and he looks after the garden. He feeds the dogs and so forth and so on. And he proudly told me two or three years ago that he watches CNN because CNN was very reliable in the news, more reliable than the Thai TV channels. <laughs> I didn't want to tell him that I think that CNN is one of the ho most horrible programs that had exist. But for him, it was the truth. <laughs> well, you know, you're, 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 shining a light on on why i think channels like this one have had this are having the success that they're having right now um in large part to people like you coming on and and you know giving the straight story uh is because i hear from so many people that you know they've just given up on mainstream financial media that they they just um they, they find it to be extremely biased um heavily skewed for the interests of the advertisers uh, but also, it's it's more of the the circus. It's more of the distraction. Uh, it's sound bites. It's not actually giving them any really useful content to help them make informed decisions. So they're having to to go elsewhere to self educate, and and they're coming online to places like corners of YouTube, where there are channels like this and, and other ones like it, where they feel like they're getting much more useful information. Yes, I mean I use YouTube extensively for two things. I watch documentaries, and I know YouTube also has censorship and so forth. But in general, the documentaries that I see are quite useful. And I, you may think that I'm a not case, but before I go to sleep, I always watch old Western movies. <laughs> no, they're great. <laughs> With John Wayne and McRae and Montgomery and so forth. And uh, I enjoy that and it relaxes me because it's not very intellectual. <laughs> that is great, Mark. Uh, all right. Um, wow, now I'm gonna picture you watching Once Upon a Time in the West, you know, uh, yes. uh, when you log off from here. Um, well, look, um, so, uh, okay. So we've, we've, we've got this scenario where we're, we're kind of hollowing out the future prospects um, uh, of of society, largely worldwide, um, right now that is concentrating in the pockets of, of the already wealthy. We have, um, you know, mainstream information sources we can't really trust. And you say that history shows that we should expect policymakers to choose door number three, which will maybe result in a, a, a false boom for a while. Again, that will probably highly benefit the upper echelon of society, but but that all that all ends at some point in time, as you said. Every civilization, you know, eventually resorts to that, and that's kind of what what undermines the society. So um, obviously, that's all not going to play out tomorrow. Um, so this isn't you know um, build a bunker in your backyard and jump in it right away. But um, what are some of the things you think people should be doing? Uh, given the type of future that you expect. Now, I, I did hear you say own some precious metals and, and certainly own some of them in a form that you yourself can control and get access to whenever you need to. What, what else would make your list? Well, as you are aware, we are now in the world involved in two confrontations that are not easy to, to solve. 
One is a war in Ukraine, which in essence is a war of the US and its uh, European allies, NATO, against Russia. The territory of the war theater is Ukraine, but it's a war, not just Ukraine, uh, Russia, but a war of Europe, the US against Russia. I don't want to go into the details why it's occurring and why some people hate Putin. Uh, the only thing I want to say is he had zero intention to invade Europe. Zero. Number two, all he asked for was that NATO would not include Ukraine. Because once Ukraine is included into NATO, the US and other countries could build uh, all kinds of military uh, bases in Ukraine right at the border of Russia. So that was his precondition. But uh, the Americans, the State Department, they wanted to go to war with him and they pushed the envelope. Now, some people will disagree with this assessment, but it's a fairly uh, correct assessment from the view of international observers. The second war is now in the Middle East. It's a most unfortunate situation. It's very cruel, and uh, I don't see their uh, solution occurring anytime soon. And an escalation is quite probable. I have friends who believe we are entering World War III. Now, the third confrontation would be Taiwan-US, uh, Taiwan-China, with the help, of course, of the US in the case of Taiwan. And that would be a very serious confrontation because the first, for the first time, missiles would land in America. The Chinese, they have the capacity and the capability to send an, a, a rainstorm of missiles onto the U.S. That, I assure you. And so that would be a disaster for financial markets and for the global economy. We, I, I hope that it's not going to happen, uh, that people will have the sense not to push the envelope too far but I think they've pushed it already relatively far. But anyway, what people should do, we don't know the future. We don't even know much about the present time because the media is so uh, doesn't tell us the truth. But I would diversify. I would have some real estate and I would have some uh, stocks and I would have some cash and bonds and I would have some precious metals or other commodities, uh, depending on your preferences. So with this, and uh, keeping also in mind, in an inflationary period, you're better off in stocks uh, that will go up, at least in nominal terms. They may not go up in uh, real terms, but in nominal terms, they could go up or they may not go down a lot if you print money. But then the question arises, uh, someone could ask me, Mark, uh, the U.S. stock market is now 50% of the world's stock market capitalization, and never before have emerging markets been so cheap, so inexpensive, relative to the U.S. In, in other words, compared to the U.S. over the last 10 years, the U.S. has grossly outperformed most emerging markets. So, if we talk about stocks, who should we? What should we buy? To this, I answer: China is relatively low, and because China is relatively low, also the surrounding countries—Singapore, Hong Kong, Thailand, and so forth—these are all markets that are not extremely low, but relatively inexpensive. But what is extremely low are property stocks in Hong Kong, because the Western media 
while well, five years ago they were all telling investors to buy China and to invest in China and so forth. Now they're all there's not a single article that appears that is positive about China or Hong Kong. So my view as a contrarian, there is value there. Number two, I have to say, compared to say stocks, commodities are low. Uh, agricultural commodities are very low. And uh, I think there are some companies in the field of agriculture and also in the field, as I said, of real estate that are reasonably priced. And the real estate that you buy, you should live in a house, not in a financial center. You should live in a small village, but don't travel to the small village with the Rolls Royce and seven employees and per helicopter and private plane and so forth. You have to integrate into a small village that is poor as being yourself a poor guy. Don't show off. Otherwise, they chop off your head in future. All right. Uh, some people refer to this as the gray man strategy. Um, yeah, don't stand out, just blend in. Um, quick, so thank you for, for sharing that list. That's super helpful. Um, one question for you about it, which is... Um, and again, this is sort of your, uh, I'm trying to tap your knowledge of history here. Um, when countries start really struggling, um, you say they resort to money printing, inflation goes up. Um, so you want to be in assets that rise in inflation. And, and for a good while, stocks will will do that, as you said, right? But at some point, if, if you really get concerned about the the remaining future purchasing power of the currency, yeah, there's an argument to get into more hard assets, right? Things that just have tangible value, like land, like commodities. Yes. So are, are, are you, would you sort of recommend as time goes on, it dialing up the percentage of your diversified portfolio that is in those hard assets? Well, I always argue you should have 25% in gold. Then the gold box attacked me why I didn't have more in gold. <laughs> <laughs> but I recently wrote a report. And in it, I showed some statistics at, that had been compiled about how much gold are in portfolio managers' portfolios. Into fund I guess it's a very small number. Tiny, tiny. So if they just want to bring it up to say not even 5%, but say 3%, it will create a huge demand for, and that I didn't mention before, a very inexpensive asset class at the present time are gold shares, the dirt cheap. They've moved about 15% in the last one month, but they're still extremely low. They've underperformed gold and they underperformed the stock market both. <laughs> so that is a very cheap asset class. All right. And I've I've heard uh, you know, several people on recent people on this program have, have, have mentioned this, which is that the sector, <clears throat> while having disappointed for a long time, um, it's a it's a small sector market cap wise. So in other words, if it starts playing catch up. You know that Wall Street loves momentum, right? So if money starts flowing into that sector, like you said, right now current holdings in precious metals is very low in the average portfolio manager's portfolio. If they start putting a percent or whatnot into this space, it really prices really could explode a lot higher because it's just so small currently market cap wise. Do, do you agree with that? You're absolutely right. Now it may never happen because. It's important to analyze who are the money managers. You understand? I'm no longer managing a fund, a public fund. And my generation is gone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All my friends have left the industries. Uh, and uh, the young people, the Generation Z, 
and the millennials, they are now in charge of huge funds. They buy bitcoins and uh, Solana and so forth. And they're not interested in gold and silver. But maybe in future, they will be interested. Because I just want to tell you one thing. If we live in a very complex society, if you compare the society of my grandparents, where people lived in, on farms, and they were self-sufficient, and the wife was cleaning the house, cooking, and sewing the clothes, and the man was working in the fields with one or two employees, and they brought home the potatoes and the chicken and whatnot. So it was a simple society. Now in New York City, you need uh, the refrigeration to function. You need the people to bring the food from the countryside, either per train or truck into the city. If someone switches the electricity off or switches the internet off, it's all possible nowadays. It's all possible. Then you're stuck with nothing. Whereas with small denomination gold and silver coins, you may have a chance to go into a department store and buy something. But of course, the employee in the department store may be so uneducated because he's an illegal immigrant. He may not know anything at all. And look at the gold and silver coin as if he came from the moon. But try to sell a, a, a Van Gogh in Africa in the middle of the jungle. <laughs> Nobody would buy the junk. Wow. All right. So, um, okay. And that's a, you know, in our, at least it's a half argument for owning some of that physical precious metals in small denominations. <laughs> if we get into a, a grid down scenario there. Um, well, look, as, as we wrap up here, Mark, um, just because you mentioned it, um, uh, I feel I have to ask because I'll get slammed if I don't um, by some part of the commenters. What, what is your general opinion on the cryptocurrencies? <laughs> well, look, uh, I'm not an expert and I don't know many experts, although they claim to be experts. But the fact is that it's grown a lot. And I know some people, they have become fabulously rich from owning Bitcoins early. Okay. Uh, these are the large holders. Most small speculators, I suspect that as in the case of meme stocks and SPACs and uh, cannabis stocks a few years ago and two years ago, AMC and GameStop, that most small investors will lose money on cryptos. But I also argue I agree with a friend of mine who says, look, Mark, yes, there's a lot of fraud in the space at the moment, uh, like in uh, every new industry, in technology and so forth, and in mining, in the mining boom cities of the, the American West. But some will survive and some will thrive and some will become sort of the index or the reserve currency of the of the cryptocurrency space. I think Bitcoin has a very good chance to become that. So do you the only that... thing I have to say, I personally, my view is that the same people that created the Federal Reserve also created Bitcoin. <laughs> that is my view. Oh my gosh, uh, I don't know if I can let you leave then without asking why. Why? <laughs> Whenever something very big happens in financial markets, it's usually not a small guy who suddenly becomes rich and suddenly a small investor or small inventor has the attention of the whole world. It's organized. And it's okay. behind the scene. Nobody knows precisely the background. All right. So the, the escape. Nobody hatch. audits the Fed. Nobody audits the Fed. 
if you ask me how much gold does the U.S. has uh, in Fort Knox, my view is zero. <laughs> and you think that's why they, they, they don't audit it. Yeah. Um, all right. So you think this escape hatch that's being you know, basically presented as here's a way to escape the fiat system. You think it's just sort of the same person offering different solution, but controlling both. Sure. Okay. My view, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm always, uh, I've been in this business for 50 years. I Sometimes I could have nightmares if I would dream of all the mistakes I've made in my life. <laughs> Luckily, when I go to sleep, I drink enough whiskey, so I sleep straight through. <laughs> well, Mark, I know you've you've you know long recommended diversification and the general you know kind of twenty five percent precious metals, twenty five percent real estate, then stocks, then global bonds. Um, do Do you think the cryptos or at least Bitcoin has merited? maybe a, a couple percent of that pie chart going forward, just, just as a, hey, we don't know what's going to happen with it. It might have some <laughs> exposure to it, or is that giving it too much, in your opinion? In my view, I can understand uh, young people who are in the crypto space. For my personal requirements and in my position, and especially with my not so high life expectancy. I don't need to make a lot of money. I need to try not to lose any money in terms of purchasing power. Yeah, I have enough. I, may, I can live very modestly. I don't need the Rolls Royce and the Ferrari, although I'm always tempted when I drive by a sales agency that has these fancy cars I think they're beautiful, and I always tempted to buy them. But I was, as a child, when I went to toy shops, I was always tempted by all the toys. <laughs> and in life, you have to sometimes uh, kind of discipline yourself mm -hmm. and not do everything you just feel at that particular time. Uh, there, there's a famous test, you're probably aware of it, that they, they give it to children. It's called the marshmallow test. And they, they, they put a marshmallow on the table with a child and say, I've got to go in the other room for a minute. Don't eat this marshmallow. If you don't, I'll give you another one when I come back and you can have two. And uh, there's a percentage of kids that just the second the adults out of the room, they just eat the marshmallow. Right. But it, it apparently is pretty highly correlated with sort of that child's success in life. And it's because if you have the ability to to not just be driven by your your immediate instincts, you know, yes, can then make smarter decisions. So, uh, so, anyways, you're you're you looks like you've been exhibiting the the right behavior from a young age. All right, well, look, we'll we'll, we'll wrap things up here. I know it's late your time. I want to give you a chance to get to your whiskey and your westerns tonight. <laughs> yes, um, but thank you so much, Mark. It's always a great discussion with you. For folks that have really enjoyed this discussion, would like to follow you and your work. Where should they go? Uh, they can go to the website, gloomboomdoom.com. I repeat, all in one word, gloomboomdoom.com. All right. And Mark, when I edit this, I will... I'm not in the advertising business. And uh, the report is suitable for some people, but it requires some reading. If someone wants to study economics and know more about how in economics relate to politics and to philosophy and to history and geography, then I think it's a useful report. If someone just looks for tips, uh, which stock will go up in the next three days by 20%, I think the report is unsuitable. <laughs> Good qualifier. Um, having been a big fan of it, um, I highly recommend those that take this subject material seriously to consider subscribing to it. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, resource. It <laughs> provides more of a framework for how to think and how to analyze the world, as you're saying. Um, so, Mark, when I edit this, I will put up the URL on the screen prominently so folks know exactly where to go. Folks, there'll be a link to it in the description below this video as well. Um, Mark, I can't thank you enough, my friend. Thanks so much for joining us. Adam, thank you very much. And I wish all of you uh, the best they can achieve in 2024. 
whereby, you know, one, we always talk about investing. I think people underestimate the importance that as you age, at each stage of your life, you must learn, in addition to what you know, something new every day. You have to have the discipline to say, okay, 20% or half an hour, I'm going to spend on learning about geography or history or philosophy or political theories or whatnot or biology or mathematics or anything. But you've got to continuously try to improve on your knowledge because the world is never constant. It's moving forward. And uh, therefore, in my view, the most important investment is actually in yourself. And of course, when you study all these things, you have to feed yourself well <laughs> with cigarettes and beer. <laughs> uh, with perfect insight. Okay. To Mark, thank you so Bye -bye. much. Bye-bye. Well, all right. Well, now's the time on the program where we bring in the lead partners from New Harbor Financial to uh, both react to uh, Mark's great insights there, uh, but also make sense of what's going on in the markets right now. I'm joined as usual by lead partners, John Lodra and Mike Preston. John, why don't we start with you this week? Um, any high level reaction to what Mark had to say and uh, anything about what's going on in the markets you wanna highlight for folks? Yeah, thank you, Adam. Great to be with you again and your viewers. Um, we, we followed Mark for, for many, many years. Obviously he's an icon in uh, the investing world. Uh, he certainly, has um, the courage perhaps of, of uh, his long tenure in markets to speak what he sees as truth. And uh, he certainly minces no words in, in um, uh, casting a critical tone uh, as have we uh, towards the role of central banks and, and um, monetary policies and, and credit creation and all the stuff that has fueled um, a massive expansion in asset prices over the last decade plus. Um, we, we certainly have echoed those comments in in uh, similar tones in, in in our words and deeds over over the many years. But um, so I, I don't want to kind of rehash that, but I appreciate his his truthfulness. And um, look, he's he's focusing on big picture things that we think are are really relevant um, for the backdrop of understanding where we are in the cycle, um, bringing it to the day to day work that we do with clients and and their financial pictures. Um, uh, we kind of need to live in the here and now and to, to a degree um, and, and not ignore and, and uh, uh, dismiss the, the very, uh, I think, appropriate critical comments that, that Mark shared against that bad track. But for, for us, it sets more of a tone of risk management and posturing more so than a um, everyday actionable investment um, action to take from, from those takeaways. We let the markets kind of lead us and, and certainly, again, use this this backdrop and the and the distortions that have been created as as a um a, a guider for our our risk management and, and hedging and and uh you know how 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 uh how, how much blind faith we're willing to put into things uh, without belt and suspenders so uh, again appreciate his comments uh but here we are um another given day in markets and certainly there's plenty of news to to, to digest uh we, we are you know, essentially near all-time highs in, in almost everything that we, we can almost say. Um, stocks are at or near all-time highs, uh, depending on what index you look at. Gold is at all-time highs uh, or, or just, just barely uh, away from them. Uh, housing is at all, you know, so we have a massive asset price escalation that hasn't really uh, done much of a pause. And and um, we, we are um, trying to adhere to, to what the market is telling us there without uh letting down our defenses uh, but those are big picture takeaways you know a noisy day in markets today with um you know some some jaw boning by the fed fed uh, fed heads in terms of interest rate policy certainly we, we can talk talk a lot about that and uh you know jobs market uh, uh data coming out but uh, i'll just pause there because I'm, I'm sure we can take this any number of ways all right um mike i'll let you comment just one sec but um you know, kind of the spirit of your comments there, John. I, I think of Mark's commentary, um, kind of build an analogy on the fly here, so forgive me if it doesn't work, but um, it, it's sort of like he's pegging w what season we are heading into. Um, and so if you know you're, you're going from summer to 
winter, right? You know, you're going to pass through fall, you know, you know, eventually it's going to be winter, but you know, once you make, conclude that, okay, winter's coming at some point, doesn't mean you put on your parka and your snow boots the next day you walk out the door, right? Um, it's just giving you a sense of what to start planning for, right? But you don't, you know, you as a capital manager, you have to still execute based on the season that we're still in, right? So we might be in the end days of summer and you know it's going to start getting cooler and crisper and eventually there's going to be snow and ice on the ground, but you're still using the analogy, you know, wearing shorts and sunscreen at the end of summer, because that's what the reality on the ground at that moment in time requires. But of course, as you're thinking forward about what you're going to do with the portfolio, you're going to realize, okay, I'm going to have to shift it more, you know, towards the seasons as we begin to enter them more, right? You're sort of nodding as I'm saying this. Yeah, but I, I just absolutely. Want to make, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, 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 I just don't want folks to get the impression that like, oh my God, Mark thinks that, um, you know, we're going to have runaway inflation and, and government intrusion in our lives and all that stuff. And I got to do it all tomorrow, right? Yeah, no, and, and even more micro, it's because it it's not that day. Do you bring a raincoat today? Do you bring, do you, you know, that, that's the way we think it. Every day has has its own um, information and signaling. Obviously, not every day d demands a massive change in portfolios and things like that, but it uh, there is there's information we digest every day to help us against that backdrop of seasonality kind of help, help, uh, we think position clients uh, portfolios in a, in a proper risk risk reward um, type of posture. Okay. Well, I, I want to get into, you know, what are you doing today, given the weather on the ground today, but real quick, Mike, let me, let me punt to you. Anything you want to add to what John mentioned about, about Mark's commentary? I think I just reiterate that I um, always love Mark's commentary and, you know, Mark, Mark's a big gold and silver bull. You know, he he rightfully criticizes, I think, central banking policies, and you know he recommends twenty five percent in gold. I think that's what he what he recommended. That's probably a little bit rich compared to what we recommend, but you know we recommend at least five to ten percent of investable assets in gold and silver. And um, I guess I just want to show the the chart really quickly on on gold and silver. I, we've talked about it a hundred times or more. Yeah, um, no, but please but, do bring it up because it, it finally is really showing what, what you in particular, Mike, have been saying for the past couple of months on this program in terms of the breakout. Well, let's take a look here. This is the monthly chart. Hopefully you can see it, Adam. Yep. And, you know, this goes back 20 years uh, and, and it's a monthly chart. And we've had this this long 10 plus year consolidation. And this was frustrating to live through the last four years, you know, particularly when, when Bitcoin was taken off. Gold was kind of going sideways, holding below $2,000 an ounce. This is the ETF that tracks gold. It's the same shape as a spot gold chart. And we've had a massive breakout these last two months. And we've long talked about here how the bears on gold thought that we had a double or a quadruple top. And you know, we pointed out, as long as, and some of your other guests have said so as well, that these things don't normally hold. And we have indeed seen a big breakout. And this is while the US dollar has been relatively strong. So this is this is a big move, a big thing. And a lot of people have been asking us, well, shoot, what about silver? The gold and silver bulls have been so tired here that they're just really dying to, to see this thing move. And when it finally moves, they start to not believe it. Let me jump over to silver. Silver has been in this the, the same long consolidation, but it's actually underperformed gold. And if you look at the last four or five years, it's formed what I think is a triangle. And it was just going the last two years sideways here at the apex of this triangle. But just in the last couple of weeks, silver has now broken out as well. And so gold to silver ratio is sitting at around 85 to one. It's a pretty extreme ratio. A few years ago, it got as high as around 120 to one. But this ratio particularly now that gold, I mean, silver is finally starting to break out, strongly favors silver. Now, we wouldn't recommend that people go all into silver, but if you're looking to get an allocation of precious metals, or if you already have one, we would recommend that you have something around two-thirds gold, one-third silver. Now, if you already have an allocation, I wouldn't go sell off, sell a bunch of gold and go into silver because the round-trip costs get kind of expensive. But uh, overall, uh, the, just it still makes sense to own precious metals. We think gold is going to at least twenty five hundred. It's at twenty two eighty five right now. It could go higher. All the technical signs are pointing up. And when lastly, I'd say that we think that gold stocks are going to start to play catch up a little bit. Let's take a look at GDX, which is the ETF for gold mining stocks. 
So we have a position here as another big triangle or, or even a triangle upon a triangle. And we're just starting to break out here as well. This could easily go to 40 or higher if the market starts to wake up to the precious metals breakout that's actually going on. It's been a little puzzling as to why this has lagged so much. And I, I got to tell you, we've had a lot of conversations with people. They're so tired of waiting for this that even the, the gold mining bulls are somewhat bearish and they don't believe it, which is a good sign. So... And we're not pounding the table and say go all in on gold, silver, and miners, but we are saying that we do believe in the allocation that we do have, 10% mining uh, stocks, and we're recommending that people have 10% bullion as well. So that's what we heard. That's what I heard loud and clear from Mark. Uh, that's what we've been saying here on this channel for a long time, that this looks like an opportunity. And uh, you know, frankly, we want to give it some room to run here. We think that gold mining stocks could go up quite a bit. I mean, we could see GDX, like I said, pretty quickly up in the 40s and even higher. So um, so we like it a lot. I'll stop so, sharing here. Yeah, Mike. So, um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I think, you know, long suffering precious metals holders uh, should hopefully be able to, you know, uh, enjoy, you know, some sort of treat tonight, nice drink, whatever, uh, and, and just pat themselves on the back for, uh, for hanging in there through the tough times and, and now finally beginning to see, uh, you know, some promising signs uh, in, in this space. Um, you know, you, you mentioned that this is happening while the dollars remained relatively strong uh, and there tends to be an inverse relationship between the, the strength of the dollar and, and the price of gold. Um, if the Fed actually does start cutting in theory, you know, cutting or easing, that should be gold friendly as well. Um, and Mark mentioned that, uh, you know, he, he, he thinks that uh, the uptrend in precious metals is confirmed and, and that this looks like a, a big move. And maybe that's because the precious metals are sniffing out future inflation to come or for whatever reason. Right. But um, my, my point is, is, um, you know, th th this could be something much more secular than just a, a flash in the pan, you know, couple month rally in the precious metals that then subsides again. Now, it could also be there could also be a total rug pull in there right i mean if, if you've been in this space for a while you've got the the scars to prove it um so i, I don't want to be selling sunshine here but i just want to say that you know you showed that that 20 year chart of gold right mike which which showed a, a deep basing pattern and that that famous cup and handle and th those technical patterns tend to to be followed by a, a big breakout like a big sea change move so all I'm saying here is you said, you, you know, you guys are going to let this run, give it some room to run. I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I imagine you're saying, yeah, like the, the, the prospects for this sector look really good. And this is the time to, to, to be in it and, and not just to try to get the quick buck and sell out, but to see where this thing could go, uh, especially because as Mark and I talked about briefly, um, it is a small sector. And if it starts catching the attention of Wall Street money managers who, you know, love to chase momentum, capital flowing into the space can really push prices higher fast because the space is so small market cap wise. So you guys are kind of nodding a little bit as I'm saying this, but let me take a breather and let you chime in. Yeah, Mark, Mark said that it's such it's such an under-owned group that it could go from a 3% allocation to a 5% allocation and the prices could literally explode. Now, I don't know what the actual institutional percentage allocation is, but it's probably less than 3%. So it's a really, really tiny, tiny sector. And uh, it could it could move quickly. When I, when I said that we want to give it time to develop, we want to give it time to develop, but that doesn't mean we don't uh, continue to hedge the position. We just sold call options on our gold mining position a little bit above current prices, and we sold it only on 50%. We don't want to cap out that position, but at the same time, we want to continue to bring in income and continue to hedge. If we get a vertical move, uh, even more so in a short period of time, we have ways that we can adjust those hedges. We can even uh, double up the call selling. We can roll out those options to higher numbers. We want to give it time to develop, but we don't want to make huge bets. I mean, we, and I, I can't emphasize enough that we're not telling people to make big bets here. You know, don't bet the farm. We've got a 10% position, but uh, I just showed the chart of GDX a minute ago. It's trading at around 33. I could see it trading at 45 within months. You know, that's not a, a guarantee or a prediction, but that's what the charts are saying is possible. And so we want to give it some time to develop. 
particularly with the wind at gold's back and silver just starting just starting to catch up at 26 or 27 dollars an ounce it could go easily well into the 30s and gold could go 2500 plus yeah okay and that, that's what i was going to ask here and again i'm not not trying to sell sunshine i'm just trying to talk about what could happen in a space like this when it comes into vogue uh because again this space has been out of vogue for such a long period of time but when it does get in vogue it tends to go a little nutty and again that's because it's it's a small space it's also a speculative space um so i was going to ask if if silver played catch up to gold in terms of maybe approaching a more historically average gold silver ratio what would it be you think that's in the 30s mike I think it's more than that. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, the gold silver ratio is 85. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see the gold silver ratio get down below 50. It's been a long time since it's been there. But, you know, if even if we got down to 60, that would be a move from 85 down to 60. That would imply a move right up into the 30s just based on that ratio changing. And of course, if gold continues higher, like I think it will, to 2,500 to 3,000. I think that we would see silver in the 40s uh, and probably approaching the old high. Now, there's no shortage of crazy predictions out there. And the truth is nobody knows how high things can go. But that chart pattern on gold is amongst the, 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 the most bullish that we've seen in any asset, including sectors and individual stocks. And it could, it could easily overshoot the targets we're talking about and then eventually pull back and pull back to levels that are maybe even where we are right now or even a little bit higher. So... We don't want people to panic buy into that sector, but a, a a measured, disciplined dollar cost averaging strategy, if you don't already own some, would be a prudent thing to do here. So very, very bullish. We're constantly looking at all kinds of sectors and we go a lot on chart pattern and fundamentals. And it has the best chart pattern out there. And I think we've been saying that for, for a long time and it looks like so far it's proving out. Yeah. And if you want the fundamental story on the mining space, watch the video I did a week ago with Tavi Costa. We get into this pretty, pretty in, in, in pretty good depth there. The 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 breadcrumbs I want to lay here, just so we can track them if they indeed happen, um, is gold is breaking out. Silver should catch up to gold. It's already starting to, as you said. But, but as you said, Mike, it could go a fair amount higher. Then the miners have to catch up to the metals, right, which we're starting to see. But as you're saying, Mike, you think that has a lot more room to run. But even the miners, you know, it, it, it's it's a two-tier sector, right? You've got your majors, you've got your your miners, um, M-I-N-O-R-S, uh, the smaller miners. Um, and what tends to happen is this: if this space really catches fire, is um, as money's flowing into the majors and their their price goes up, that gives them more um, powerful currency to then do M and A in the sector. And so you see the juniors, the junior miners um, really catch fire <laughs> because um, all of a sudden the big companies in that space are going on a buying spree. Now, we're not there yet, but but this is sort of the progression of breadcrumbs that if if this space really came alive the way that it, it has in past booms in the sector, you, that's how you sort of would expect to see the capital flows there. So who knows if that's going to happen this time? No guarantees at all, like you said there, Mike, but we'll be tracking this as as time goes on. And it's interesting because I have a, a portfolio of mining stocks that uh, you know I've, I've, I've built over the years. And honestly, it's it's got a lot of red still in it. Um, but it's it's nice to see green for the day over the past couple of weeks uh, in in those holdings. And uh, it's it's nice to see them begin to claw back some of those losses. It's going to take a little while before I'm I'm green on a number of these things uh, in, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, you know my buy-in price, but um, but I'm already beginning to see you know the, the body start showing signs of life here, which is encouraging. That's a typical experience. That's a typical sentiment, Adam, that people feel that that gold mining bulls feel is that we've had a big move here and yet they're still down. And if they just get back to even, maybe they'll get out. So <laughs> even, even the big gold bulls are a little bit bearish. That's what I'm saying. And that's what I'm seeing. That's that's kind of a good sign. Now, there's no guarantees that the, the big puzzling thing here, though, is what the heck is wrong with the gold mining stocks? Right. But if gold stays up where it is or goes higher, the market should wake up and they should snap higher. Uh, like I said, even the gold bill, bulls are worried. Well, what happens to the miners if gold drops another, or if it rolls over and drops $100? Are we going to see the mining shares collapse and have the rug pulled out under our feet again? That's the, the wall of worry that we're dealing with here. Nobody knows how that'll play out, but 
um, you know, we're betting that we're going to see that snap higher and uh, time will tell. All right. Well, we'll see. And you guys will be here every week to uh, to call the action for us. All right, John, heading back to you. I know you have a couple of charts uh, kind of back to the analogy of of seasons, but daily weather. Um, wh what are you seeing, you know, kind of on the daily weather side right now? And how's that impacting your thinking there? Yeah, well, uh, seems like every day is a day where folks are super focused on Fed and, and will they cut? Will they cut? How much and when will they cut? In terms of short-term interest rates, and and there's been a quite a, a sea change in in market expectations and even Fed signaling uh, over the last several months that uh, really hasn't we think rippled through markets yet. Um, just today, um, the Atlanta Fed president uh, Bostwick was out saying that he thinks perhaps only one cut is appropriate this year and maybe later in the fourth quarter. Uh, that's off uh, from late last year and even earlier this year with the Fed you know, pretty strongly voicing an expectation that they they could foresee three cuts of a, a quarter basis point each time in, in 2024. Uh, and of course, this is all on the backs of um, frustratingly sticky inflation readings over the last several months that, you know, obviously it moves around up and down uh, month to month, but uh, there's been a trend there. And uh, I just want to share a couple of charts here to kind of give, give, a, give a sense here for what's going on. So let me um, pull up a slide here. So this is a uh, a chart I came across courtesy of of Bloomberg, and I think it's it, it pretty eloquently puts things. It basically shows since uh, the second half of well, since 2022, 2023, basically the um, the red line here is the expected you know Fed, Fed policy inverted, meaning when this is going down, that the the expectations for rate cuts have have moderated, that they won't be as aggressive in cutting, and you can see. Uh, Late last, you know, basically uh, late last year, um, and I guess it's just 20, 23 and 24, my apologies. Uh, late last year, the 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 market was in, imputing a pretty steep increase in in the probability of rate cuts and that th those rates would, would be cut pretty dramatically. And of course, the markets rallied almost in lockstep with that. Since the turn of the year, however, there's been this jaws gap opening up. And uh, quite simply, the market has continued to power higher, all while expectations of of, of rate cuts have uh, have ch uh, changed dramatically. And let me just show you what that looks like. Uh, if I can pull up a chart here, this is this is a uh, chart over time of the probability, assumed probability of of the Fed staying at current levels at this this coming June's uh, meeting, rate policy meeting. You can see uh, at the end of last year into this year. The market was pricing a zero percent probability that the Fed would 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 be at at current levels come June. In other words, they would have cut by June. Since that time, since about February, those those odds have have come way off. So, uh, just to put it in a comparison, this is what it, what it looks like um, right now. The today, there's a slight increase in the probability of of the Fed staying put at five and a quarter to five and a half. That's up just slightly from yesterday. So there's been a bit of, bit of a back and forth today on those expectations. But the point being is that um, the markets really haven't digested that pretty dramatic um, change in expectations. Uh, the one market that perhaps has is the bond market. Um, bonds have actually sold off pretty pretty strongly. 10-year uh, yields uh, are up, up back up above 4.4%. And I'll just share a, a, a chart of, of TLT as an example of, of what the bond market is doing. This is a chart of TLT. I'll just minimize us here. Um, you know, we had some some strength in the bond market late last year, but it's been a, a pretty um, range bound declining trend here. And, and we've, um, you know, just today sold off pretty hard. We're rebounding intra intraday here a bit. But this is, uh, again, with with 10 year yields at about 4.4 and change. We think we're getting close to the area where where this might find some footing that that uh, yields may pause about four and a half is kind of our token target maybe 4.45 if you, you're into Fibonacci series that's where the 61.88 percent Fibonacci level is but we're getting close we think we're we're adding a little bit to longer term bonds can make sense but they've been a a, a very frustrating if, if not unkind place to be in in recent weeks. Yeah, and it's interesting. Um, <clears throat> more than any other topic, inflation expectations is where I see the greatest difference of forecast with the the experts that I have on this channel. Um, uh, it's not exactly 50-50, but but I feel kind of like half the folks I interview 
make a really compelling argument for secularly higher inflation going forward and that, you know, inflation is going to be sticky for the next year plus. Um, and, you know, uh, folks that are doing the long duration bond trade are going to be disappointed. Uh, and then half say the exact opposite, right? Which is that, um, you know, disinflation, maybe even deflation is, is, is the bigger worry. Steve Hankey, who I just interviewed, uh, this past weekend, who who nailed the the nine percent CPI target uh, months and months in advance, quarters in advance, um, he thinks that uh, inflation will be at two percent or less by the end of the year. So he actually thinks it's a really good time uh, to be buying the ten year as a trade in in his uh, mind to, uh, to 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 ride you know the, the price appreciation price appreciation up as inflation drops for the year. So uh, it's just going to be really interesting uh, to see um, who wins that uh, uh, that that tug of war because we shouldn't have that much longer, you know, just a quarter or two to figure out really who is right there. Um, how are you guys playing this? Are you? I, I guess you said you're 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 not adding right now, but you 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 may start to increase your exposure if the ten year hits four and four and a quarter, four and, sorry, four point four, yeah. four and a half. Yeah, we're getting real close. And and the great thing is you don't have to be all or nothing in this in this debate, right? It's a matter of degree. Um, we have currently about a five to seven percent allocation to longer term bonds through vehicles like TLT. Um, we think it's appropriate, been appropriately modest. Uh, we, we've uh, very much favored shorter term treasury bills uh, for our, our fixed income safe ballast. And it's been a great place to be with with yields where they are right now on a relative basis. But we're getting close. We we're probably would look to add a bit to that, uh, maybe another five percent or so. Uh, we don't think having 30 or 40 or 50 percent in, in longer term bonds right now makes sense because there are um, good structural reasons why this this could be a, a range bound. And I think part of the, the the you know fuel for this bifurcated debate is just the massive um, history we have. We've got a 40 year history behind us of declining interest rates. In some ways, that's all we know, right? So this idea that that um, the next forty years might look completely different is almost repels the mind. And of course, we've got the knee fl knee jerk reflexive assumption that the Fed is just going to suddenly print and put money in the system and buy bonds and everything's going to be patched over again. I think we're now, um, uh, you know, seeing that th this has become a whack a mole thing, right? Uh, uh, problems keep popping up because of these policies that have been. Um, dished out over the last decade, we might say two decades or more, um, that doesn't make that kind of that that quick come to the rescue policy choice as as simple and easy as it maybe has been in the past. And, um, you know, so um, it, it's, there's a good reason why there's, I think, a, a healthy debate about which side things will shake on, because we're in that kind of tipsy, turvy, um, unstable uh, phase, I think, as a result of those excesses that have been built into the system. All right. Well, we're going to have to start wrapping it up here. Um, I, I want to uh, congratulate you guys on on what I know has been a good couple of weeks for you, especially as the precious metals complex have, have come to life, uh, has come to life. Um, I'm, I'm imagining that that tailwind's got to feel quite nice. Um, uh, so as, as we wrap up here, a couple quick things. One, uh, John and Mike, um, uh, this video is releasing after the video uh, that I shot with uh, former FOMC member uh, Thomas Honig. Um, I know you guys haven't seen it yet because the time we're recording this, that video actually hasn't launched yet. I can't wait to hear your guys' feedback on it next week. So we'll devote some time in, in, in next week's uh, session with you to getting your guys' response to that. Um, I think you're going to love it. Um, and also maybe be kind of depressed that he validates a lot of uh, of the skepticism that we have about sort of how the Fed operates. Um, but we'll we'll talk about that next week. Um, folks, uh, if you have uh, enjoyed this discussion uh, with Mark, would like to have Mark back on the channel again as soon as his schedule allows, please let us know that by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Um, as a reminder for all these interviews, including this one with Mark, um, I publish the... Um, uh, my summary, um, my cliff notes summary, which I call Adam's notes uh, summaries of these uh, these deep uh, discussions uh, on our Substack at adamtaggart.substack.com. Uh, the uh, the write ups are available to the premium subscribers of that Substack. If you want to sign up for that, uh, head over to the Substack there. Uh, and then, as a reminder, um, as you know, Mark <laughs> did a much better job than I can of 
of shining a bright light on the uncertainty and challenges to wealth building and wealth preservation that see, he sees ahead. And uh, as, as Mike and John have talked about here in terms of just having to navigate the day-to-day the -day weather on the ground in the financial markets, highly recommend that almost everybody watching this, unless you're a highly experienced and successful DIY investor already, work under the, the guidance of a good professional financial advisor who takes into account all the macro issues that Mark and John and Mike and I have been talking about here. If you have a good one who's doing that for you and then executing that plan for you, great. You should stick with them. But if you don't, if you'd like a second opinion from one who does, maybe even John and Mike themselves and their team there at New Harbor Financial, uh, just uh, fill out the short form at thoughtfulmoney.com to request a free consultation with them. These consultations are totally free. You get bespoke, highly personalized advice to your own particular situation. There's no commitment to work with these guys. It's just a free public service they offer to help as many people as possible position as prudently as possible for what may lie ahead. Guys, thanks so much for joining me this week. Mike, I'll let you have the last word here. Don't really have much to add here, yeah, other than what we've already said. The big opportunity seems to be in metals and in miners, but the stock market still has done no wrong. We continue to tighten up our, our hedges a little bit. We've, uh, uh, we have we didn't talk about everything that we did this week, but it's been pretty busy. We actually just increased our, our hedge on the S&P. We moved it from 4,700 to 4,900 just the other day. And so we continue to tweak with our options um, the best we can to try to ride this train for as long as it goes. But nobody knows the inflection point. They don't know when it turns. And um, I saw we would caution people uh, from, from trying to play that game. So uh, we've been doing this a long time. We know that even we don't know exactly when it turns and which is why we're doing what we're doing. So stay safe. If you want to talk or chat about anything, give us a call. Thank you very All much. Right. All right, gents, again, thanks so much uh, for hanging with us this week. Look forward to seeing you next week. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching. Bye for now, Adam. Thanks, Adam.